Hello and welcome back to Linode. In today's video, we're going to talk about aliases. One of my guilty pleasures, I love aliases. It gives you the ability to create your own Linux commands, essentially. You could take a very long command and then scrunch it down into a very bite-sized morsel, an alias of even just a few characters. You could call your alias whatever you want. You could create your own, and you could even use it to include commands that are chained together. There's all kinds of cool things that you could do with aliases, and what I'm going to do in this video is teach you how aliases work, and then I'll give you some of my favorite aliases that you can use yourself. So let's go ahead and get started. So how exactly do you create an alias? What I'm going to do right now is give you a simple example of creating an alias, and then I'll show you my favorites. The alias command, as you see here, is the command that we'll use to create an alias. And the way that the syntax works out is we first give it a name, basically what we want to call our alias. I'm just going to call mine my command abbreviated. We're going to set that equal to something. There's no space here. And inside the double quotes, we type another command. So as a quick example, I'll type ls-lh. So what exactly did that do for us? Well, from now on, if I type my cmd, just like that, that's what I called the alias, it actually executed ls-lh. Now, we could probably argue that typing my cmd isn't all that much shorter than simply typing ls-lh. But this is just an example. To create an alias, you give it a name, and then you give it the command that you want executed anytime you type that alias. Now, one thing we could do is actually make this a lot shorter and actually somewhat useful by just lowering it down to one letter. Because again, you can name your alias whatever you want, even if you only name it one character. So now that I have an alias that is just the letter L, if I type L and then press enter, then that'll execute ls-lh. And with this variation, we have our first alias that's actually, dare I say it, somewhat useful. And typing one character is a lot easier than typing out that entire command. So we just saw a few examples of creating an alias. So how exactly do we list the aliases that we have on the system? For that, we simply type alias, but we won't include any options or anything like that. We'll just type alias by itself. And as you can see here, I have, well, several aliases. I've only created two. I created this one right here. And I also created this one. Now, the reason why I have so many aliases here is actually because various distributions will give you some aliases by default. So when you run the alias command on your end, your output will probably look a lot different than mine. The output will include all the aliases that the distribution has given you, along with all the ones that you've created yourself. Okay, so we know how to create an alias, and you've also just seen how to list all the aliases that you have on the system, but how do you remove an alias? Well, that's actually easy. We have the unalias command for that. Now, earlier we've created an alias that was down to just one character, L. That's the one that executes ls-lh. If I press enter on this, it's going to actually delete that alias. So if I run alias again, with no arguments, we can see that the alias of just L is no longer on the list. In the previous output, the L alias was actually right above this one right here, and now it's gone. So now you know that the unalias command enables you to remove an alias. Now how about we check out some of my favorite uses for aliases? Now this isn't an exhaustive list or anything, I have quite a few. But what I've decided to do was just narrow this down to my favorites. I do want to give credit to whoever out there originally created some of these aliases. I'm not going to take credit for all of these myself. Some of these I found quite a few years ago when I was learning. But I don't remember where I got these from originally. So I just want to call out the fact that these are not mine. These are aliases that I've picked up over the course of my career, over the course of years. Anyway, let's check out the next alias. And what we're going to do with the next alias is simplify the output of df-h. This is what it looks like right now. As you probably already know from previous videos in this series and other videos on this channel, 
the df command, or disk free command, what that allows you to do is see how much storage you have available. The dash h option gives you human readable output. Essentially that means it'll show the output in megabytes and gigabytes. And on my end, there's nothing really truly wrong with this output. I can see the root file system right here. I'm only using 4% of it, so I don't have that many lines of output. Now, some of you guys out there, you might have pages of output when you run df-h. So how do you narrow this down to just the output that you care about? So let's set up the alias. I'm going to name the alias df, and as you know, that's already a command on the system. df is short for disk free. If I create an alias that has the same name as an actual command, then the alias will override the original command. So what I'm going to do is set that equal to df-h-x. I want to exclude squash fs if it's present. Another dash x. I want to exclude tempfs. Dash x again. And this time I want to exclude dev tempfs. I'll press enter. And there we have the alias. When I execute it, you can see that we have fewer lines of output here. Effectively, the dash x option allows you to exclude, and I've excluded some things that I didn't care about here, so I have only the output that I do care about. So now the output of the df command is a lot simpler. In fact, I don't even have to type df dash h, because dash h is part of the alias. So I've simplified that down to just df, but when I type df, it's going to instead execute this. As you'll see, if I just copy and paste this command right here, the output is going to be exactly the same. And it would be the same even if I didn't create the alias. So this actually served multiple purposes. This entire command was simplified down to just df, and it also excludes file systems that I don't want to see information for, which allows me to get to the information that I care about a lot easier. Now for the next alias, I'm going to show you what it looks like before and after. But to do that, I'm going to need to shrink the font size a bit. And the reason for that is because the mount command actually produces quite a bit of output. As you can see here, it's just all over the place. As I'm sure you remember from a previous episode in this series, the mount command allows you to mount additional file systems to your Linux system. But if you execute the mount command by itself, it just gives you a list of everything that's mounted. But I want to clean this up a little bit because it's just all jumbled together and honestly kind of hard to read. So let's set up another alias. I'm going to call this one ls mount. I'm going to set that equal to mount. And I'm going to pipe that output into another command. And the command that I'm going to pipe it into is column dash t. Just like that. So if I enter ls mount, which is the name of the alias, and you can see that everything is a lot cleaner. Basically what it did was it forced the output of the mount command to be separated into columns. And for me, that makes it a lot easier to read. There's still a lot of information here, but since it's in columns, I think it's just easier to digest. So let's go ahead and try another fun alias that I like a lot. I'm going to call it extip, and I'm going to set that equal to curl, then I can has, and it's misspelled on purpose, that's the name of the website, I can has ip.com. Just like that, you will need curl installed in order for this to work. So if you don't have curl installed, you'll need to install it with apt, dnf, or whatever your package manager is. So, let's see what happens. And there it is. That's actually my external IP address. And in my case, it actually shows me the correct IP. You are not able to see it on your end, but just take my word for it. This is actually the correct IP address. So, as you can see, that's a very useful alias to have. So at this point, what I would like to do is simplify the process of installing packages. And to do that, I will yet again set up another alias. I'm going to name this one install. And this is going to vary from one distribution to another but I'm running on Ubuntu in my case, so what I'm going to do is set this alias equal to sudo apt install. So normally what I would do to install a package 
is I would run sudo apt install and then the name of the package. So maybe I want to install tmux or something like that. But with this particular alias, I could simplify it down to just install and then the package name. So there we go, it's installing tmux. And in my opinion, that's a lot easier to type than sudo apt install. However, I can make it even easier by simplifying this alias down to just i. And that allows me to type i and then the package name. So tmux, for example, it's already installed. And that's a lot easier than typing out sudo apt install or even just install. I have a simple alias of i for installing packages. On your end, if you're not running Debian or Ubuntu, then maybe you would change that to dnf install, yum install, pacman dash capital S, whatever your package manager is, but you get the idea. This allowed me to simplify the command all the way down to one character. Similarly, I could set up another alias for upgrading packages as well. And that's a longer command. So first of all, with Debian and Ubuntu, we generally like to run sudo apt update first because we want to update the package sources and repository indexes. And then we type a double ampersand, which means that if this command is successful, we want it to run the second command right after. So by typing upgrade, it's going to first run sudo apt update, and then sudo apt dist upgrade. Let's go ahead and see it in action. I'll simply type upgrade, I'll press enter. And in my case, I've already installed all the updates on this computer, so I don't have any updates to install. But if I did, then I could run this one word command of upgrade to make sure that all available patches and upgrades are installed on this machine. For this next alias, you'll need to have Python installed on your system. So you could type which and then Python to see if it's installed. And if you don't get any output, then it might actually be called Python 3 in your distribution. It varies what each distribution calls their instance of Python. Python 3 is generally the one you want. Some distros actually have Python 3 under Python. In my case, it's user bin Python 3. So for this one, you do have to have Python installed like I mentioned. I always recommend Python 3, but it doesn't really matter. You just want to make sure that you have it installed. So I went ahead and pasted in the alias right here because it's just a longer one and I didn't want to bore you guys with watching me type all of this. But effectively what I'm doing is I'm creating an alias called speed test and I'm setting it equal to this. And what this is doing specifically is it's using curl to pull down a Python script from GitHub and it's going to redirect that right into Python 3. Now that could be just Python in your case. Like I mentioned, it differs from one distribution to another. But I'll press enter to save the alias. Let's go ahead and run it. And as you can see, it went ahead and did a speed test. Now in my case, this isn't actually an accurate speed test. I've set up throttling on my network to make sure no one device can use too much bandwidth. So I'll never have the full speed show up in the speed test. And your results might be lower as well if you have some sort of bottleneck in your network. But as long as you don't have a bottleneck, you should be able to get a fairly accurate speed test with this alias. How cool is that? So now what I'm going to do is show you guys two aliases that are closely related. So I pasted in the first one right here. I'm calling it mem5. I'm not going to explain everything that it's doing right here. You can check the man pages if you really want to get the finer details. But what this should do, if it works, is give you the top five processes that are using the most memory. And here I've pasted another alias. This one is very similar to the previous one, but the main difference is that it's going to show you the top five CPU-hungry processes, while the previous one shows you the top five memory-hungry processes. So now if I type mem5, I get the top five processes that are using the most memory. And of course, I could do the same thing when it comes to the CPU usage by typing CPU5. And now we can see the top five processes that are using the most CPU. And you could go ahead and play around with this. For example, you could change this to CPU10 and then change the number here to 10. And that'll give you the top 10 processes that are using the most CPU. In fact, let's go ahead and try it.
And as you can see, I get quite a bit more output. Now one downside is that all of these aliases are specific to this particular shell. So for example, if I open up a new tab here, and I'll type CPU5, that's an alias that we've created, the command is not found. But it does work, you've seen me use it before, and I'll do it again right now, and it works in this tab. And the reason for that, like I mentioned, is that everything you set up when it comes to aliases is session specific. So if I was to close this terminal window right here, I would lose every alias that I set up. So how can you make these permanent? Well, what you would do is you would edit your bash RC. I'll just use nano. And the file name is .bashrc. The dot means it's a hidden file. So I'll press enter. And your output is probably going to look quite a bit different than mine. Each distro has their own default bash RC file. But what you can do is scroll all the way down to the bottom. You can add a comment, although this is optional. I just like to do this. So I'm just adding one of the aliases here that we've used previously. Control O and then enter to save the file. And then Control X to exit out. So now, if I open up another tab here, I type I and then Tmux, even though it's already installed. It's asking me for my password, that's a good sign. And the command worked. And I didn't have to set up that alias because I put it in the bashrc file. And because I did that, that file was read when the shell was created, which also means that that alias was created as soon as I launched this shell. So what you can do is add all of your favorite aliases to your .bashrc file in your home directory. And from that point on, your user account will have access to all of those aliases every single time you open a terminal. As you can see, aliases are awesome. They leverage your creativity when it comes to Linux administration. And I'm really curious to know what your favorite aliases are. So be sure to let us know in the comments down below. I look forward to checking that out. As always, thank you so much for watching and subscribing. And I'll see you again very soon.